Hey there, is today your first time here? Or maybe your first time in a while? If so, maybe you're wondering exactly who we are and what this church is all about. Well, we'd like you to know that we're a group of ordinary people who are on an amazing journey together, following Christ. Our guide is the Bible because it's the divinely inspired word of God and it will never take us in the wrong direction. Along the way, we hope you'll see that we are welcoming and spiritually passionate and that getting to know you is a big deal to us. We know that the road is rough sometimes, but we'll work really hard to bring you practical and relevant messages to equip and encourage you through life's ups and downs. We want you to know that we care about this community and we believe that it's our job to make it a better place. So no matter who you are or where you've been, we're glad you're here with us today. And we hope that you'll join us on our journey, following Christ and living out his plan for us. So welcome to church. Good morning. It's been a last year since I've seen you. It's been so long. Hey, I want to encourage you this morning by letting you know we are still in Genesis. I'm, I'm hoping to be done with Genesis sometime mid-year. Um, and, and, you know, as I tell people we're going through Genesis, they're like, really, what takes so long when a lot of churches go through the Bible in a year and through this and that? And I remind them, there's just so much. You don't want to skimp on the Bible anywhere. If you go to study something and to learn about something, we should put it all fully to it. Amen? Amen. And so this morning, we are picking back up in Genesis. Uh, but we're in a great part. We're with Joseph. You know, many of you know Joseph. Maybe you don't. He's right over there. Um, I'm kidding. Hey, Ida Eisenhower was asked if she was proud of her son. And she says, absolutely. Which one? <laughs> Ida had um, 12 sons, excuse me, six sons. And she was proud of all of them equally. I'm one of 10 kids, eight boys, two girls. I'm not going to tell you which one mom's favorite is, but you may know them. Um, but it sounds like a lot, and Masha is one of 12. How many boys, how many girls? Six and six, right? Your parents knew how to have balance, mine didn't. Uh, but when we look at the Bible, Jacob, Joseph's father, had 12 sons. Each one of these sons was a little bit different. But when we think about Joseph, we realize that Joseph came to Jacob later in life, and we know this, that Jacob loves Joseph right? Why? Because he made him this really cool jacket or robe or whatever you want to call it. Uh, Pastor West was going to wear his. I chickened out. He chickened out. I don't have a robe like that or a jacket like that, but he was his father's favorite because he was older. He'd be like Pastor Roy and Jan having a child. That child is going to be our favorite because we realize it's probably a miracle child. Amen? Would that be a miracle, Jan? Amen, all right. But what we know about Joseph is, right off the bat, we know he has a coat of many colors. We also know he had dreams. But it's an interesting story when we start to look at Joseph. Joseph's life can be broken down into almost three segments. He was with his mom and dad till the age of 17. At 17, he went to Egypt as a slave. I say he went, he was forcibly taken. And he spent 13 years in Potiphar's house as one of Potiphar's slaves. And then later he's promoted to the prime minister or some title there in Egypt for another seven years of prosperity, then another seven years of famine, another 14. After that, Joseph brought his entire family to Egypt and they stayed there until he died at the age of 110 years old. But Joseph's story is an interesting one and sometimes we can miss the story of Joseph. And what it really means in this um, image behind me, prisoner to prince. That is really the story of Joseph. And it possibly could be mine or your story as well if we begin to do what Joseph did. Right? What did Joseph do? Joseph stayed faithful. No matter what was going on in his life, Joseph was faithful to God and didn't lose it. So here's what I want you to know today. Joseph took all the obstacles in his life and turned them into opportunities. He had every reason to be bitter, 
but his attitude stayed focused on God. Amen? Too many times in our lives, something happens, we get bitter, and you, we always hear the thing, you either get bitter or you get better, right? And that's not really true. Sometimes you get bitter and you never get better. Your life just becomes meandering about and just waiting for life to happen to you. I want to let you know, we were not created for life to happen to us. We were created in the image of God to live an abundant, full life. It's hard to do that when you're bitter, when you're upset. When you feel like what God has given you in your life was taken away. And Joseph had every opportunity down through his time to feel that way. So if you'll join me in Genesis chapter 27 this week as we read the first 11 verses. But before we get too far into the series, I felt like we needed to set a baseline of understanding who Joseph is. Because he's probably not who you think he is. Here's how it reads in EIV. Jacob lived in a land where his father had stayed in the land of, land of Canaan. This is the account of Jacob's family line. Joseph, a young man of 17, was tending the flocks with his brothers, the son of Belam and the sons of Zilpah, and his father's wives, and he brought their father a bad report about them. Now, Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other sons because he had been born to him in his old age and he made an ornate robe for him. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him all the more. Let me pause there. Uh, you can leave it there. If you start rubbing it in people's faces, they're probably not going to like you, just in case you didn't know, right? Yeah, really. So let's go to the next one. He said to him, listen to this dream I had. We were binding sheaves of grain out in the field when suddenly my sheave rose and stood upright while your sheaves gathered around mine and bowed down to it. His brother said to him, do you intend to reign over us? Will you actually rule us? They hated him all the more because of his dream and what he had said. Then he had another dream, and he told it to his brothers. Listen, he said, I had another dream. And this time, the sun and the moon and even the stars were bound down to me. When he told his father and all his brothers, his father rebuked him and said, what is this dream you've had? Will your mother and I and brothers actually bow down to you, to the ground before you? His brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the matter in mind. Father, we love you. We thank you. Lord, as you speak blessings over us, remind us that we are to be good stewards of the things you call us to do. So Lord, would you help us walk in light this week, today, this hour, this moment, that glory may be given to you through what we say and do. In Jesus' name, amen. This is an interesting thing. I would dare say sometimes Joseph appears to be oblivious to the obvious, right? Now, I want to back this up a little bit. If we go back a couple chapters, you may be reminded, I think one of my last sermons to you, where Joseph's brothers attacked the man that raped his, their sister, Dinah, remember? And they had all these men circumcised. And when they were in pain, Joseph's older brother, Benjamin, and him went in and killed everybody. So Joseph's older brothers are these trained killers who don't take anything, any gruff from anybody. Now here comes daddy's favorite. He's saying, you're going to bow down to me. One, that's dumb. If, if you know somebody can whoop you, kill you, beat you up, it's probably not a good idea to tell them they're going to be subjective to you. Amen? I, like, I, I work out with a lot of really large, strong men at the gym. I am excited exceptionally kind to them, <laughs> right? I, I'm one of eight boys. I, they're all bigger than me. Even my little sister's bigger than me. I, I learned at an early age, if somebody can whoop you, they probably will, especially if you speak in areas that are not kind, right? 
Nobody loves to have anything rubbed into their face, especially mommy and daddy's little favorite, right? And sometimes I, I wonder, you know, while God has called Joseph to do something remarkable, God did not call Joseph to do that to his family. But again, there's a lot of innocence there, isn't there? And so this morning, I want to just talk about three quick things that we can learn from Joseph in this situation. The first one is this. Don't rub your blessings in other people's faces, right? Here's what it says in 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 3. Do not keep talking so proudly or let your mouth speak such arrogance. For the Lord is a God who knows and by him deeds are weighed. Here's what I'm saying this morning. If God has called you to do something, don't shove it in other people's faces, right? You just don't. And a lot of times when I hear people beyond bragging about what God is doing in their lives or what, how God has used them, they seem to point to themselves for all the glory. If God is using you, remind yourself and remind everyone it is by the glory of God that God is using you. Joseph's lucky he survived those first couple dreams, knowing his older brothers, right? If you really think about it, I don't know, how many of you guys in here were mom and dad's favorite? Just show of hands. It's kind of obvious, I already knew, right? Because there is, there's an innocence about being mom and dad's favorite, but mom and dad's, I will tell you, unless you have an only child, like Ivana, Pastor Wes, Brett, you're allowed, and Charles, you're allowed to be the favorite. You're the only one. But that also means you're the most disobedient. That also means you're the troubled child when you really start to look at it, right? You know, so many times you're like, oh, I'm mommy's favorite, I'm daddy's favorite. But if you're the only child, it's like being the, you know, um, the best student in a homeschool class, right? <laughs> Malachi 2.2 says this, if you do not listen, if you do not resolve to honor my name, says the Lord Almighty, I will send a curse on you and I will curse your blessings. Yes, I've already cursed them because you've not resolved to honor me. Listen, God wants to bless you. He absolutely wants to bless you, but he does not want you to weaponize that blessing to punish other people, to make them feel inferior or insecure about the blessings God has given to them. Each and every person is blessed in various and different ways. Do not use your blessings to harm people or to lift yourself up or to be prouder than you should, as the psalmist says. Make sure that God gets all the glory for his using of you. Amen? The truth of it is God knows all and he sees all. He alone sees the intent of our hearts and knows our thoughts. Jehovah watches arrogance and pride and feeling of our hearts, even when we try to disguise it. Nel Shaddaiah notices when we talk down to someone, our Father is aware of how we treat others. If God has blessed you, church, in different ways, remind yourself it is God that has blessed you. Maybe you have a big 401k. Maybe you've inherited a lot of money. Maybe you have a really cool Dino Ferrari. I wasn't talking to Masha. Um, but I mean, God has blessed all of us. Some of you, you God has blessed you with health. God has blessed you with intelligence. God has in, uh, blessed you with creativity. And, and the list goes on and on and on. And the Bible talks about how we are the body. Each and every one of us is part of the body. So if we're going to be part of the body, you're going to receive different blessings. Some are gifted in being able to work with youth. Some are blessed um, being able to work in uh, hospice. And the list goes on and on. Own your blessing. But use your blessing to glorify God. And the way you do that is loving those around you that God has put in your life. Amen? The second thing is this, is don't be jealous over somebody else's blessings. I would dare say Joseph's brothers were this way. Today's society, we get so fixated on how someone is successful or how someone else's life appears to be so perfect, right? One of the woes of social media is everybody paints a pretty picture, right? Right? 
And the truth of it is, that's not a reality of the world. That is just a reality that we try to perpetuate that we're doing okay. I don't know too many people who are perfect. And by perfect, I don't mean earthly perfect, but it just seems like their life is good. They have no problems. They have no worries. They have no concerns. They're just perfect in everything they do. And the many you find out or you think you know someone who is, all you have to do is look a little deeper. How many stars and famous people do we know that's committed suicide? How many people seem to have everything going on until later we find out they're addicted to some horrible drugs or alcohol? How many times have we seen what looks to be the perfect relationship end in divorce? How many times have we seen the perfect child go rogue like the prodigal child? Listen, just because something appears on the facade to be something of a blessing, always understand that may not be the reality. Every one of us, every Sunday morning, we walk into church, don't we? We, we put our Bibles right here. And we walk in and we're good, right? We're, we're what is it? Jacqueline laughing at me. We're saved, sanctified, chicken fried. We got it all going on. Somebody asks, how you doing? You're like, I'm fine. Lord has blessed me and we act like we got it all okay. And all of a sudden we look at it and be like, oh, I wish I had their relationship with God. Sometimes we get a little jealous over people's relationship with God, wishing we had that kind of relationship. Never do that. Every relationship is different. Every relationship is at a different level, at a different place, a different understanding. And sometimes you like the final product, but you didn't like the process they had to get there. So many times that's what we forget. We forget what people have gone through to get where they are. Amen? Which takes me to the third part is this. You and I need to learn to succeed in silence. Work in silence and let success make the noise. That's a well-said quote from Frank Ocean. And it's very common to hear people quote that for people who are hardworking. Why? Because it takes hard work. Nothing is just given. And when it's given, it's usually not appreciated. And the truth of it is, why I say work in silence or succeed in silence is because truthfully, not everybody wants you to succeed, right? Not everyone wants you to succeed. They want to see you fail at it. Not everyone will understand your journey and they'll try to discourage you. Not every successful person wants you to be successful with them. These are all harsh realities of the world. The safest way to obtain your success is with quiet persistence and a whole lot of prayer and strive towards your goal every day. I remember when I was felt first called to be a pastor. I was like Joseph. I was just telling everybody, right? I, I re refused to listen to my call for a long time. And when I finally submitted, it was like this great flood of emotions came flooding out of me. So I understand where Joseph is at. And I started telling everybody, God, God has called me to be a pastor. Now, if you would have known the old me, you'd be like, no, no, you're, you're not called to be a pastor, right? I'm not perfect like you guys. Just so you know, I know you, you guys are the best church. You guys all walk on water in the shower in the morning, don't you? Some of you ladies have a hard time taking a bath because you can't get below the water because you're staying above it, right? Myself, on the other hand, it's a little different story. It's a story of tragedy and pain and problems. It's a hard story. And so when I started saying, I felt God calling me to be a pastor, I was so gung-ho, I was so excited, and my mentor calls me to lunch. And we're saying, I'm waiting for this great information to be told to me, right? I mean, this guy, his dad is a pastor. He knows it all. This is going to be great. I'm going to be given the tools of that first step. It's kind of like um, Masha and Nicholas. Like, tell me, I, I'm eager, and I was so excited. And we sat down, and I'm waiting for this great wisdom. And he looks at me and goes, I don't think you're called to be a pastor. Maybe you should go to work for promise keepers. That's still kind of ministry. But I don't think you're called. Do you know how much that hurt me? devastated me but I also used it as fuel to make sure that I didn't listen to what man had to say and I listened to what God had to say amen I will let you know not only did I become a pastor obviously but I actually sat on the board of promise keepers later on I just felt like that was a little extra to show that person God has bigger plans than we can perceive amen here's what I want you to know God's got a plan for you 
God did not accidentally create you, right? Remember in Jeremiah 1, 5, for the, I know the plans I have for you. And he also says, before I formed you in your mother's womb, I knew you. And so when God created you, he created you for a purpose. He created you with this, this plan for your life, and the plan included him involved in it, and the plan included glory and love and encouragement at any age. Listen, if you're still alive today, God's not done with you. Do you realize that? You know, Abram was only in his 90s when he got his ministry started. So Terry Garris, there's still hope for you, Terry. 90, 900, it's, you know, it's the same, right? But God has a purpose. This is one of the reasons why, as Christians, we cannot support abortion. Because we know every child is an absolute important part of God's plan in our world. Amen? Thank you for that, right? Joseph had a plan. The plan was to follow what God said no matter what. Here's what I want to ask you this morning. Do you know what God's plan is for you in your life? Do you know what you were created for? Really think about it. See, the problem is we get so focused on what other people's plans are. We get sour. We get upset if we don't get all the attention. We get upset if we don't get the glory. We get upset if we don't stand at the pastor's pulpit. We get upset if we don't get the promotion. We get upset if we don't get this and we don't get that. As we go through Joseph, I want to let you know, Things didn't go easy for Joseph. Right off the bat, we know that God has a plan for Joseph. And you know we're going to see it through. But it's not an easy path. And maybe your path hasn't been easy. Maybe your path has been hard. Maybe your path has been full of tragedy and pain, hurts, disappointments, letdowns. I'll let you know, God's not done with you. We read in, in the word of God, there's so many people at a young age and an old age and at every age, every gender, every nationality, God calls us to something remarkable. My question is, if we were to read your story in here, do we read your story and what God is doing with you? Do we read the story of obedience or will we read the story of disobedience? I still believe in heaven. God is up there and he's watching you and I and he's taking notes and he's writing our stories down for the next generation. And it may not be in heaven, but it'll be here. How many times do we talk about some of the great saints who's come through this church and the churches we've been in? And we love to tell about their stories and the amazing things they've done. Make sure you're part of that. And when it gets hard, Realize Satan is trying to stop you from what God has called you to do. The question is, will you be strong enough to push, to keep going when Satan makes it impossible? Because with God, all things are possible if we're faithful. And if we give God the glory, we don't shove it in people's faces and we stay in prayer. We stay concentrated and we stay focused. Amen? My question is this, what has God called you for? What is God calling you to do? What does God want you to do? Do you know? Was it just to be a good husband, a good wife, to work in the factory, to work in white collar? I mean, is that really what God called you to do? It actually may be. I think one of the greatest blessings is to be a parent. I'm about to find out the, the other greatest blessing is to be a grandparent, right? I still believe grandparents make the best parents. I'm looking forward to that because a lot of the bumps and bruises you've been through, you're a lot wiser now. You're a lot more graceful now. You don't have all the pressures that young people do. You just have different pressures now, don't you? And maybe God has called you to be a voice in the darkness. Maybe God's called you to be the voice coming from the desert. Maybe God's calling you to a ministry you've not yet fully stepped into because you're scared. I remember that day being scared because I felt like God gave me a dream. God gave me a vision. God gave me a purpose. And when you have that, you have one or two chance choices. Do it or not. It's that simple. It's not even eloquent. If God calls you to something, you have free will. Be obedient or not. 
If you're not, you're going to miss out some of the best blessings in your life. But if you follow what God calls you to do, no matter how hard, no matter how painful, God gets the glory, and so will you. So many times we, we like to look at the people in the Bible like they were perfect. Every one of them was a mess, like the person sat next to you. Not you, the person next to you, <laughs> right? All of a sudden, everybody's looking around wondering who's by them, right? But if you look at it, they, they all had problems. They did. They weren't perfect. But God perfectly used them. And God wants to use you as well. Are you aware of that? God wants to use you. And it may not be saving the Israelites. That's been done. But God may be using you to save your family. Your kids, your grandkids, your co-workers. God calls all of us to do that. Amen. So throughout this week, during your prayer time, I would just ask that you pray. Lord, how can you use me today? God, what is my purpose? What are you calling me to do that's greater than I can believe I can do? Because God will always call you to do something greater than you can do. Amen? That's proof that God is alive and well within you when you accomplish the impossible. Amen?